Hey guys, welcome to Refuge Online and ABC Studios. As you can see, we've had a little bit of a change here. I did not know this, so I wore white today. I feel like it would be really easy for you to green screen me into something, Photoshop. <sighs> kind of regret giving you guys that idea. But anyways, welcome back to our second lesson in our series of 2 Corinthians. If you remember last week, or if you listened to it last week, we talked about Paul's relationship to the Corinthian church, how he got there, how he knows them, and all the different letters and communications that they've sent to one another. And the book of 2 Corinthians really is a letter of love to the 2 Corinthians, and Paul is also defending himself against these people in the church that have grown in and kind of said that they've criticized Paul. And because they believe that God is in fact against Paul. They reason that God has opposed Paul in his message. And they know this because Paul encounters a lot of resistance and a lot of hardship wherever he goes right? He suffers immensely. It seems like everywhere this guy goes, there is a fire, right? There's flames going up everywhere and smoke follows him. And if that's the case, if God is in fact against Paul and not with Paul, what does that say about the message that he preaches? The gospel that we know today. And if you were here with us last week, you'll know their argument has some validity to it. It's grounded in some truth. Remember Paul's journey to Corinth? He was beaten, he was imprisoned, he was chased all over Greece, and they were trying to seek and kill him. And there's very little doubt that Paul has suffered greatly. And it's not like things have slowed down for Paul either by the time he writes 2 Corinthians. I mean, he's still being just chased out of towns. He's still being beaten. He's still being in prison. All this stuff is still happening, and he's still encountering stiff opposition to his message. Paul, later in the book of 2 Corinthians, will compile a list of all the ways in which he has been inflict, afflicted. And it's incredible. In fact, it's a miracle that he is still alive and walking at this point in 2 Corinthians because if it was anyone else, if it was me, I tell you what, I would be dead or I would have given up. We know that Paul is an apostle and that he was sent out by God and he is the, the greatest evangelist, possibly the greatest evangelist who's ever lived. And he wrote much of the New Testament, yet these people who met and spoke, him, uh, spoke with him and knew him well, are doubting. So why are they doubting him? Well, I think the reasoning isn't that much different than that of which many people have today. In fact, we can doubt God and how he is working when we ourselves endure suffering of all different kinds. When we go through hardships, we all have the inclination to ask God, why? How could you let this happen? God, if you are all powerful, if you are loving, why did you let me go through that? Suffering comes in all shapes and sizes, and it's not always the physical pain that we're talking about with Paul. It's not always being bit, beaten by rods or being in prison. In fact, a lot of times it's emotional, and sometimes it's spiritual. Being abandoned, receiving verbal abuses, abuses of all kinds, being betrayed and not being accepted, and many more things is, is very painful and we dread them because they hurt. And in one way or another, we will experience. Because the fact is, we will have a portion of suffering in our lives, whether that's more or less than someone else's, is not our decision, but it will come and we will hurt. 
And when it does, we have the possibility of reacting one of two ways. The first way is to become bitter at God and at life and curse him for making life this way and wanting nothing to do with him and try to make sure that it, that this suffering never happens again. You build up walls and make sure no one has the opportunity to hurt you that same way again. And the second way you react is to trust God in the midst of the suffering to trust him and find him faithful and seek comfort and peace in him. And you know the difference, of course, is the first person is serving the God of all comfortability. And the other is serving the the God of all comfort. And all too often we mistake our desire for a comfortable, easy life an easy cushion life with what God wants for us. And so often we are far too short-sighted because we want an easy life here and now. But Jesus didn't die on the cross to make us comfortable or to have us, his followers, have an easy 80 years of life on earth. He died for something far greater. He did it so that we could be made new. He did it so that we might become the righteousness of God. Don't, and also don't believe that God doesn't care about the trials you go through today or that he isn't with you. Remember how God comforted Paul in Corinth last week after Paul was being chased around and after he was exhausted and afraid, God came to him and said, Paul, don't be afraid any longer, for I am with you. But what, but what if God desires something greater for us than a life of ease? What if he is preparing us for an eternity with him? What if his desire is to make us new and to become more like his son? Paul doesn't give the Corinthians any delusions nor does God's word give us, gives us false prom- promises of, if you do this just right, if you follow God this way, you will no longer endure hardship in this world. In fact, he and God's word says kind of the exact opposite. And note how he begins with praise th- to despite facing the circumstances and sufferings that he goes through. Read with me in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. If you have your Bibles, if you don't, pause this. Open up the 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. And it says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all, tr- in our, all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we re- ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Now, there are two titles that Paul uses for God in these verses. The first is the father of compassion. What, what does that mean? Well, it means God is the beginning, the author the one who gives us the understanding of mercy and compassion. He's the one who created love in which all love comes forth. He loves more. He empathizes more. He (laughs) desires mercy more than anyone else. And we may think that God doesn't care about us and what we are going through, whether that is little or big. But he comforts us in all our troubles. For he is the father of all compassion and no one cares more for you than God. He has counted every hair on your head. And when Jesus came to earth and he saw death and his, he knew his friend Lazarus had died. And even though he was raising him up, he knew he was going to raise him up. It says that Jesus wept. And he wept because 
the world is broken and that there's suffering and the consequences of sin ultimately is death. Not only did Jesus weep, not only was he moved in spirit, but he went to the cross for that very reason, to purchase the victory over sin and death for us so that we would no longer be slaves to sin and death. He is not a distant God, but a God who loves and cares for you. He is the God of all comfort, meaning he doesn't just have sympathy or pity, or mercy for us, he also takes action and comforts us. When we were going through suffering, Paul Paul knows this firsthand, and that's why he's writing it. But I can also testify from my experience that this is true, and and God's word repeats this promise over and over again. And one of my favorite spots is in Psalms 34, 18, which says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God doesn't abandon us when we are hurting. He longs to comfort us and he gives us hope that is greater than the pain we endure. He comforts us not just for our sake either, but he comforts us so that we might be able to share the comfort that we receive from God with others who are troubled and suffering and to encourage one another. Now look at verse five with me again. It says, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Uh, One of my favorite songs right now is called The Road, the Rocks, and the Weeds, and it's by John Mark McMillan. And my favorite line in the whole song says this, and you can, you, you can hear the passion in his voice. And it says, what to, and what to tell my daughter when she asks so many questions. And I fail to fill her heaviness with peace. When I've got no answers for hurt knees or cancers, but a savior who suffers them with me. Guys, we don't follow a God who promises freedom from suffering in this life. Instead, we serve a God who suffers them with us. Not only does he not abandon us today, for he will never leave nor forsake us, but he himself came to suffer in our place so that we would be free from its source of suffering, sin, and the ultimate consequence, death. And he has given us the promise of life, of a life one day free from all of it free from sin, free from suffering, free from death. Jesus died so that we may live. He suffered so that we might live. And he secured our redemption by his death and resurrection, which was tremendously painful in every way. Paul knows this and he believes it. And his belief becomes action. For he is also living it out himself. He is suffering. He is dying so that others may know the gospel and be saved and live. His death is causing life in others. Second Corinthians 1, 6-7, going on through where we're, going, where we're at in our chapter, says, If we are distressed... It is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Later in the book, Paul would write this in 2 Corinthians 4, 11 through 12, which says, For we who are alive are always being given over to death, for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Paul is living like Christ. He is following Christ's example in his actions and obeying his word. 
Matthew 16, 24 through 26 says this, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Guys, Paul isn't living for the God of comfortability. A God that he, he's made or envisioned for himself to justify his behavior or justify his actions a God that allows him to shut himself in and live however he sees fit or ever he wants. Paul is living radically for the person of Jesus Christ. He gave, he's giving himself over to death and suffering because he loves Jesus with all his heart, with all his soul, and all his mind, and knows what he promises is real and desires others to know the gospel and the love that Jesus has for them. Paul counts Jesus worthy of his sufferings, meaning he sees his sufferings as worth suffering for Jesus because it's far greater than comfort in this life. And it's because, it's all because Jesus gave his life for him. We love because he first loved us. And guys, we have the same choice today. And the question we need to be asking ourselves is who are we serving? The God of all comfortability or the God of all comfort? The God that we envision or make for ourselves to justify our behavior? Or Jesus, the Jesus of scripture, the word of God? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your constant love and compassion towards us. God, you love us so much and so greatly that you never leave, never forsake us, and that you call us to live a life not just for ourselves, but you call us to live and give ourselves up for others because that's what you ultimately did for us. God, you are so good and so loving and you promise something far greater than comfort in this life, but a life that can never be taken away. Rust nor moth can take it away, but a life that is in you, God, for all eternity. God, thank you so much for your constant love and your grace and for how much you love us. I pray that we would serve you in spirit and in truth and not serve uh, a God that we've envisioned that helps us you know, justify what we do. God, thank you so much for your, for being the God of all comfort, for being the father of compassion. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So the next few weeks or so, we'll be going into more detail and following Paul's uh, letter to the second Corinthians, which I can't tell you how excited I am for it even though we are already going a lot slower and covering a lot less than what I wanted when I start writing. It just keeps going, and I wanted to get through verse 11 today, but we'll have to do that next week. Thank you so much for listening. Feel free to message me, and uh, I can't wait to hear from you guys. Hopefully see you soon. Miss all of you, and see you next week.